A very good evening as friends, I welcome you all to the Hindu daily news analysis brought you by Shankar A.S. Academy. As friends, many of you are watching our videos without subscribing to our YouTube channel. So please subscribe and hit the bell icon button so that you will get regular notifications about our current of videos. Now before getting into discussion, I have an important announcement to you. The announcement is regarding prelims test series. Batch 4 of Shankar A.S. Academy's prelims test series is about to begin. The orientation for the test is already concluded but still you have a chance to enroll in this batch 4. The first test in this batch will start on 16th December 2023. A total of 48 tests including MARC and CSAT will be provided in the test series. So go and register to the test series immediately and boost your prelims score. Now with this announcement let us get into the daily news analysis. Today I am going to cover important news articles from the Hindu newspaper dated 10th and 11th of December 2023. Displayed here is a list of topics that we will be discussing today. At the end of the video, we will also have prelims practice question discussions. So try to watch the entire video. Now let us get into our first news article discussion. Look at this news article. This article is taken from yesterday's newspaper. This article talks about the expansion of nesting sites of green turtles. Recently, some researchers have developed a research model for predicting the nesting location of green turtles. The research is modeled on how different greenhouse gas emission scenarios could affect the nesting range of green turtles by the year 2100. The results found that worsening climate change leads to the greater increases in the nesting ranges of green turtles. Okay, This is the finding and this is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion let us understand some important points about the green turtle from prelims perspective. The green turtle is one of the largest sea turtles in the world. It is the only herbivore species among the sea turtles. They are named as green turtles because of their green colored cartilage and fat but not because of their shells. The green sea turtles mostly feed on sea grasses and algae. So the fat of green turtles appears greenish. That is why it is called as green turtles. Here note that in the eastern pacific region a group of green turtles have darker shells and they are called black turtles okay this is the basic information about green turtles now moving on to say about the characteristics of green turtle as i said already the green turtle are herbivores and they mostly graze on sea grasses and algae by doing this they maintain the sea grass beds and make them more productive the green turtles have paddle like limbs called flippers. This allows the turtle to move quickly and easily through the water. The green turtles migrate long distances between the feeding grounds and the beaches where they hatch. Here note that the green turtles are particularly susceptible to rising sea temperatures. This is because the sex of the green turtles offspring is dependent on incubation temperature. Okay. Now moving on to say about the distribution of green turtles. The green turtles are found throughout the tropical and subtropical seas of the world. There are two distinct population of green turtles in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Apart from this, it is also found in the Indian Ocean. As we saw earlier, the rising global temperatures lead to an increase in the nesting range of green turtles. So now it is said that the green turtles are also found in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay. So this is all about the distribution. Now talking about the threats, the green turtles face various threats. They are loss of habitat, accidental catching during fishing, illegal trading of green turtles, climate change etc. Okay. Now finally let us see the conservation status of green turtles. Due to high threats, the green turtles are placed under the category of endangered in the IUCN red list of threatened species. They are also listed under Appendix 1 of the sites. In India, the green turtles are protected under Schedule 1 of the Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This accords high protection to the green turtles in India. Okay, this is all about the conservation status. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw about various informations regarding green turtles. See, this topic is very much important for your prelims exam. So, revise all the facts that we discussed. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this news article. Recently, the forest minister of Maharashtra has requested the central government to consider their proposal to construct an airport near the 
Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. Additionally, the minister told that the state government has responded to all the queries of the National Board for Wildlife regarding airport construction. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this discussion, let us see some important points about Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve and about the National Board for Wildlife. Now, first, let us see about Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. First of all, know that Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve forms part of the Tadoba Andari National Park. This national park is the oldest and largest national park of Maharashtra. Now, coming to the Tiger Reserve, the Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve is one of the India's 47 Project Tiger Reserves. It is located in the Chandrapur district of Maharashtra state. It is situated approximately 150 km from the city of Nagpur. The word Tadoba is derived from the name of God Tadoba or Taru. This god is praised by local tribal people of Tadoba region. And the word Andari is derived from the name of Andari river that flows in the national park. Okay, this is the basics of the reserve. Now let us see the vegetation and flora and fauna found in the Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. The vegetation of Tadoba forest is mostly dominated by the tropical dry deciduous forest. Teak is the prominent tree species seen in the forest areas of Tiger Reserve. Here note that the major part of the forest areas of Tiger Reserve are in the hilly areas. So hillocks and terrains of such forests provide shelter to the wild animals in the Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. The Tiger Reserve is known for its dense forest area, smooth meadows and deep valleys. So it provides a great atmosphere to house more number of tigers. Apart from tigers, some of the important animal species like leopard, sloth bear, wild dog, gar, chital and sambar deer are also found in the Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. Due to the presence of various animal species, the Tadoba National Park is the main attraction for jungle or tiger safari. Okay, this is all about Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve. Now let us see about National Board for Wildlife. The National Board for Wildlife was constituted in 2003. It was constituted by the central government under Section 5A of the Wildlife Protection Amendment Act 2002. As it was created under the Parliamentary Act, the National Board for Wildlife is a statutory body. Here note that the National Board for Wildlife has replaced the Indian Board for Wildlife. Okay. See, this is the basic about National Board for Wildlife. Now let us see the composition of the National Board for Wildlife. The National Board for Wildlife is a 47 member board and it is headed by the Prime Minister. The Minister in charge of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change serves as the Vice Chairperson of the board. The board also consists of members from government departments, then members from parliament and NGOs. The board even consists of 10 eminent ecologists, conservationists and environmentalists. Okay, this is all about the composition. Now finally, let us see the functions performed by National Board for Wildlife. Firstly, the board has the power to review all wildlife related matters. Secondly, the board approves the projects in and around national parks and wildlife sanctuaries in India. And finally, the National Board for Wildlife gives approval for the alteration of boundaries in national parks and wildlife sanctuaries. So boundaries of national parks and wildlife sanctuaries can be done only after receiving the approval of National Board for Wildlife. Here note that the decisions of the board are only advisory in nature and it is not binding on the government. Okay. So these are all some of the important functions performed by the National Board for Wildlife. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw various points regarding Tadoba Andari Tiger Reserve and we saw some important points about National Board for Wildlife. See both these topics are very important for our prelims exam. So revise all the points that we discussed. Now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion. Look at this editorial article. This article talks about the government's attitude towards air pollution in India. The author points out that the BJP government has made numerous promises in the election manifestos regarding controlling air pollution. Some of the promises include ecological audit of developmental projects, prioritizing air pollution control mechanisms, then introducing emission for 
clean air etc but the author is concerned that these promises made in the election manifestos of the bjp government remain only as a promise and there are no any positive outcomes so the author criticizes this attitude of the bjp government and he urges the government to hold priority talks about air pollution and climate change in the winter session of parliament okay this is the crux of the editorial given here now in this context let us understand the causes and effects of air pollution and then we'll see the measures taken by the government to address air pollution we will understand these points using our mains answer writing approach now first let us see the question the question is enumerate the reasons and effects of rising air pollution in india list out the steps taken by the indian government to tackle air pollution 250 words 15 marks see this question can be asked in general studies paper 2 under the syllabus topic of government policies and interventions for development in various sectors and issues arising out of their design and implementation the question even can be asked in general studies paper 3 under the syllabus topic of conservation environmental pollution and degradation environmental impact assessment okay this is the syllabus now coming back to the question this is a very straightforward question first we have to write the causes and effects of air pollution and then we have to write the steps taken by the indian government to tackle air pollution okay now let us straight away get into the introduction since the question is about air pollution we can give a brief definition of air pollution and then we can also mention some important data about air pollution in india now let us see the definition of air pollution and some data air pollution refers to the contamination of the indoor or outdoor air it can be caused by any chemical physical or biological agent that modifies the natural characteristics of the air present in the atmosphere okay this is the definition of air pollution according to iq airs world air quality report in 2022 india was the eighth most polluted country in the world in the report nearly 39 indian cities appeared in the list of 50 most polluted cities in the world the report also stated that air pollution is the second biggest risk factor for disease in india this reflects the effect of rising air pollution in india okay so this way you can write the introduction for the question if you notice carefully we also provided some data to support our answer okay now moving on to the main body of the answer here we have to split the body of the answer into two parts in the first part we have to list the reasons and effects of rising air pollution in india then in the second part we have to write the steps taken by the indian government to tackle air pollution now first let us look at the reasons for rising air pollution in india the first reason is the industrial and vehicular emission see burning of fossil fuels like coal petroleum and etc releases huge sulfur dioxide so this is one of the main causes of air pollution apart from this the hydrocarbons which make up petroleum do not burn completely in vehicle engines this leads to the emission of particulate matter nitric acid carbon monoxide etc to the environment this also leads to high pollution levels okay this is the first cause secondly certain agricultural practices lead to increased air pollution for example ammonia which is a byproduct of agriculture is one of the most hazardous substances that pollutes the air apart from this stubble burning and practices like slash and burn agriculture increases the emission of particulate matters this leads to increased air pollution in addition to this monocropping of rice across the country is responsible for large amounts of methane emissions for instance paddy fields in india produce about 20 percent of the world's methane due to their swamp like environment so this huge methane emissions also contribute to the high air pollution then the third important cause is construction and demolition activities these activities also increase the load of particulate matter and degrade air quality then the fourth main cause of air pollution is landfills in the long run the landfills can produce methane carbon dioxide nitrogen hydrogen and non-methane organic compounds see these gases can also contribute to high air pollution finally the use of firecrackers also increases air pollution firecrackers are mostly used in diwali celebrations as well as in weddings and political functions 
this also leads to increased air pollution okay so these are all some of the reasons for air pollution in india now talking about the effects of air pollution firstly air pollution causes respiratory diseases for example some studies says that air pollution in india is responsible for the highest number of respiratory diseases like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and asthma the air pollution is also responsible for the rising cases of cancer and stroke throughout the country the studies show that due to respiratory diseases the people in cities have a reduced life expectancy of 9 years at the present stage apart from this a study conducted by the lancet found that nearly 1.6 million deaths in india could be attributed to air pollution in 2019 this comprises about 18 percentage of total deaths in the country so respiratory diseases and associated death is the important effect of air pollution secondly air pollution contributes to climate change the emission of greenhouse gases leads to extreme weather events this affects the energy balance of the earth this in turn causes economic and livelihood losses okay and finally the air pollution is causing the depletion of the ozone layer this results in the melting down of glaciers and causes the sea level to rise this in turn affects coastal communities and small island nations okay so these are all some of the important effects of air pollution now moving to the second part of the answer here we will see the measures taken by the government to address air pollution firstly you can write about the launch of the national clean air program it is a pollution control initiative launched by the ministry of environment forest and climate change through this plan the government aims to reduce the concentration of particulate matter in the environment by at least 20 percentage in 2024 in one or two cities including delhi secondly the central government releases the national air quality index it is being released by the central pollution control board this index provides information for the public regarding air pollution this helps the people to take adequate safeguards against air pollution thirdly the government has brought in stricter emission standards for vehicles for example recently the central government has adopted bharat stage 6 norms to limit harmful exhaust emissions from the vehicles okay fourthly the government of india has adopted the fame india scheme this scheme aims to promote the adoption of electric vehicles for the faster adoption of electric vehicles the government provides subsidies to the buyers of electric vehicles and finally india has also adopted alternatives to fossil fuels through various schemes like gobardhan and ethanol blending here note that under the gobardhan scheme the government aims to convert waste to energy by promoting a circular economy okay so these are all some of the measures taken by the government to address air pollution okay you can write these points in the second part of the answer now having completed the body part let us move on to the conclusion in the conclusion part we can give a balanced view the conclusion can be like economic development is often accompanied by environmental pollution this is because the economic growth also leads to more greenhouse gas emissions dust and so on in the target of achieving 50 percentage of installed capacity of clean energy by 2030 currently india's installed capacity of clean energy is around 44 percentage india is nearing to achieve the 50 percentage target before the deadline of 2030 as air pollution levels keep on rising in india the target should be enhanced in order to shift towards cleaner energy by doing this india will surely achieve the goal of net zero emissions by the year 2070 okay so this way you can write a conclusion for this question and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion through the mains answer writing approach we saw the causes and effects of air pollution in india then we saw about the measures taken by the indian government to tackle air pollution now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article months ago the central government has launched the pm vishwakarma scheme this scheme is aimed at providing skill upgradation training to the traditional artisans in our country while launching the scheme the government invited applications from the artisans this article reports that the scheme has received over 21 lakh applications in two and a half months the highest number of applications had come from karnataka followed by west bengal assam uttar pradesh etc okay 
this is the crux of the news article given here now in this discussion let us understand some important points about the pm vishwakarma scheme the pm vishwakarma scheme was launched on september 17 2023 on the occasion of vishwakarma jayanti here note that vishwakarma is a primary deity of the craftsman people the vishwakarma is also said to be the divine architect of the devas in hinduism now come to the scheme the pm vishwakarma scheme is primarily aimed at providing governmental support to workers who engage in traditional crafts and skills since the scheme is related to craftsman it got the name of craftsman deity vishwakarma the vishwakarma scheme is a central sector scheme this means that the scheme is fully funded by the central government the scheme was set up with a budget of rupees 13000 crore note that the scheme will be implemented for a period of 5 years that is from financial year 2023 24 to financial year 2027 28 okay the nodal ministry for monitoring the scheme is the ministry of micro small and medium enterprises however the scheme will be jointly implemented by the ministry of msme the ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship and ministry of finance okay this is the basics about pm vishwakarma scheme now talking about the objectives the pm vishwakarma yojana aims to strengthen and nurture the guru shishya parampara or family based practice of traditional skills this means that the scheme promotes the passing down of skills within families that are engaged in art works and crafts making the scheme also aims to improve the reach of products and services of artisans and crafts people by integrating them with the domestic and global value chains okay this is all about the objectives of pm vishwakarma scheme here note that there are 18 occupations which are covered under the pm vishwakarma scheme i have listed the occupations here you can pass the video and go through it okay now finally let us see the benefits of pm vishwakarma scheme firstly under the scheme the vishwakarma workers will be registered for free through common service centers using the biometric based pm vishwakarma portal then they will be provided recognition through the pm vishwakarma certificate and id card in addition to this the artisans and crafts people are provided with the credit support of up to 2 lakh note that the credit will be provided with a concessional interest rate of 5 percentage this is the first benefit apart from this the scheme provides skill upgradation toolkit incentive and marketing support to artisans and crafts people the scheme offers a stipend of rupees 500 for skill training per day and rupees 15000 grant for the purchase of modern tools okay this is all about the benefits of pm vishwakarma scheme and that's all regarding this discussion in this discussion we saw various aspects of pm vishwakarma scheme now with these points in mind let us move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article this article is taken from the faq page of yesterday's newspaper this article talks about the crimes against women in india this article analyzes the data from 2022 national crime records bureau report apart from this the article also discusses the laws created for women safety in india so in our discussion today you will understand the important points mentioned in this faq article now first let us see the data from the 2022 ncrb report now first let us see the data about the crime rates in our country the report of ncrb shows that overall crime rate in india was declined in 2022 the crime rate was reduced to 258 per lakh population compared to 268 per lakh population in 2021 however the report notes that crime against women rose by 4 percentage in 2022 compared to the previous year okay this is the first important data provided in the report secondly the report points out the nature of crimes against women the report says that majority of crimes against women were cruelty by husband or relatives which comprises 31.4 percentage of crimes the cruelty is followed by kidnapping or abduction of women then assault with intent to outrage modesty and rape the ncrb report points out that in 2022 13479 cases were registered under the dowry prohibition act okay 
Then thirdly, the report explains the reasons behind rising crimes against women. The report says that increase in crime rates against women can be attributed to patriarchal society, unchanged male mindsets, societal attitudes despite high education levels, strengthening of regressive value systems, etc. So this highlights the need for strong political will to elevate women's status. Okay, this is the third important data provided in the 2022 NCRB report. Fourthly, the NCRB report shows that there is an increased registration of crimes against women. The report says that overall 4.45 lakh cases were registered in 2022, that is nearly 51 FIRs are recorded every hour. This means there is an increased registration of crimes against women in India. Now, what is the significance of this? The increased registration of crimes reflects that women feel confident to approach the police and get criminal cases registered unlike the olden days. Okay, so this is all about the 2022 NCRB report. Now we got to see about the laws created for women's safety. See, government has created many laws for women's safety in the past. Some of the important laws include Immoral Traffic Prevention Act 1956, Dowry Prohibition Act 1961, Protection of Women from Domestic Violence Act 2005 and the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention Act 2013. See these are all some of the laws created for protection of women. But the implementations of these laws have serious problems. Now let us see the challenges in implementing these women safety laws. Firstly, poor quality of police investigations and delays in judicial process in courts contributes to the poor implementation of women safety laws. Secondly, low representation of women in the police force leads to more workloads on women officers. This causes slower investigations and convictions in crimes related to women. And finally, various social factors like illiteracy, poverty, social customs and values, religious beliefs and mindset of the society they also hinder the effective implementation of women safety laws okay so these are all some of the important challenges in implementing women safety legislations in india to conclude ensuring women safety in india in line with sustainable development goal 5 that is gender equality will help to overall development of women for example empowering all women and girls and addressing issues like violence and discrimination can help to achieve gender equality this in turn ensures the prosperity of nations and progress of societies. Okay, and that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion, we saw the data from 2022 NCRB report, and then we saw the challenges in implementing women safety legislations in India. Now, with these points in mind, let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article. This article is taken from yesterday's newspaper. This article talks about the Pradhan Mantri Janjati Adivasi. Nyaya Maha Abhiyan, that is PM Janman scheme. This scheme is aimed at improving socio-economic conditions of particularly vulnerable tribal groups, that is the PVTGs. So in this discussion, let us understand about PVTGs and about PM Janman scheme. Now first let us see who are PVTGs. See particularly vulnerable tribal groups, which are shortly called as PVTGs or tribal communities in India that are considered the most vulnerable among the scheduled tribes. They were identified based on certain criteria. The criteria include pre-agricultural level of technology, low level of literacy, economic backwardness and a declining or stagnant population. See if the ST populations meets these criteria then they are termed as particularly vulnerable tribal groups. Currently there are 75 particularly vulnerable tribal groups spread over 18 states and in one union territory that is Andaman and Nicobar. The highest number of PVTGs reside in Odisha. The main purpose of identifying the PVTGs is to provide integrated socio-economic development to the most underprivileged section of scheduled tribes in a coordinated and planned manner. Okay, this is all about the PVTGs. Now coming to the PM Janman scheme, the PM Janman scheme was announced in the budget speech of 2023-24. But very recently, that is in November only, the scheme got the approval from the central government. 
the main aim of the scheme is to improve the socio-economic conditions of the PVTGs. This will be done by supporting the PVTGs to integrate to the mainstream services and opportunities. Okay. Now talking about the features of the PM Janman scheme, under the scheme level crucial interventions will be provided to the PVTG people. It includes permanent housing, road connectivity, piped water supply, mobile medical units, hostel construction, anganwadi facilities, skill development centers, electricity connections, solar street lighting, Bandhan Vikas Kendra and mobile towers. Okay. As the scheme focuses on various sectors, nearly 9 key ministries that are responsible for health, livelihoods, tribal affairs, telecom etc. are involved in the implementation of the PM Janman scheme. Okay. This is the first feature. Secondly, the scheme will have a total budget outlay of rupees 24,104 crore and it is a centrally sponsored scheme. So, the sharing of funds by the center and the states are in the ratio of 64 is to 36. Okay. This is the second important feature. And finally, the initiative covers all the 75 PVTGs spread across 22,544 villages in 220 districts of India. Okay, this is all about the important features of PM Janman scheme. Now finally, let us see the challenges in implementing the PM Janman scheme. The lack of an accurate and current data set of the PVTG populations is one of the big challenges in implementing the scheme. Currently, we have the population data based on the 2011 census. In 2011 census also, the government was unable to tabulate the population of PVTGs in Maharashtra, Manipur and Rajasthan. In addition to this, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs is yet to compile an accurate and current data set of the PVTG population. So the lack of accurate data about PVTG population is posing a serious threat for the implementation of PM Janman scheme. Okay. And that's all regarding this discussion. In this discussion we saw about PM Janman scheme, its features and the challenges in implementing the PM Janman scheme. Now with these points in mind, let us move on to the next part of the video that is to discuss preliminary practice questions. As friends, today we are having four questions. I will solve three of them and one will be a quiz question for you. Look at the first question. This question is regarding PM Vishwakarma Yojana. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. It is a central sector scheme. See this statement is correct. As we saw in the discussion, PM Vishwakarma Yojana is fully funded by the central government. So it is a central sector scheme. Now coming to the second statement, the nodal ministry for the implementation is the Ministry of Skill Development. See this statement is incorrect. As we saw in the discussion, the nodal ministry for monitoring the scheme is Ministry of MSME and it will be jointly implemented by Ministry of MSME, Ministry of Skill Development and Ministry of Finance. So the scheme is not solely implemented by the Ministry of Skill Development. So second statement is incorrect. Now coming to the third statement, the scheme solely focuses on skill development without any credit facility. See this statement is also incorrect. Under the PM Vishwakarma Yojana, the artisans and craftspeople are provided with a credit support of up to 2 lakh along with skill development. Here only first statement is correct. So the correct answer for the question is option A only one. Moving on, let's take up the second question. See this question was asked in UPSC 2019 prelims. Here four statements are given. We have to find which of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. Some species of turtles are herbivores. See this statement is correct. As you saw in the discussion, green sea turtles eat sea grasses and algae and they are herbivores. So first statement is correct. Now coming to the second statement. Some species of fish are herbivores. This statement is also correct. Some fish species consumes the algae from seabeds. So some fish species are herbivores. Now coming to the third statement, some species of marine mammals are herbivores. See this statement is also correct. Sea cows which are large mammals that live in shallow coastal areas, they feed on sea vegetation. So they are herbivores. Now coming to the fourth statement, some species of snakes are viviparous. Here the term viviparous represents the animals that produce live babies from their bodies rather than laying eggs. Some snakes are viviparous. They develop their young ones through a placenta. So fourth statement is also correct. Here all the given statements are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option D 1, 2, 3 and 4. 
Moving on, let's take up the final question. Here three statements are given. We have to find how many of the statements are correct. Look at the first statement. The term PVTG was first used by the DBAR Commission in 1960. See, this statement is correct. The term particularly vulnerable tribal groups was first used by the DBAR Commission in 1960. See, this committee was set up to study the scheduled tribes across the country. Here, first statement is correct. Now, coming to the second statement, a stagnant or declining population is one of the criteria for determining PVTG status. See, this statement is correct. It is one of the criteria in determining PVTG status. Now, coming to the third statement, Pradhan Mantri Janjati Adivasi Nyaya Mahabiyan, that is PM Janman, in a centrally sponsored scheme. See, this statement is correct. This particular scheme is implemented as a centrally sponsored scheme with the share of funds from both the center and states. Here all the three statements are correct. So the correct answer for the question is option C, all three. Displayed here is a quiz question for you today. I will post this quiz question in your community section. Try to answer it. And displayed here is a main question for your practice. Go through the question, write your answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of the video. If you found our video to be useful, do like, comment and share it with your friends. And don't forget to subscribe Shankarai's Academy YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.